Hope can seem like an ideal fantasy, a desire that's ultimately out of our control. I mean, what more can you do than hope for the best, right? But the hope that we receive from God is more than just a sense of optimism. It's a concrete hope rooted in the truth of the gospel, a hope that is the bedrock for our life and an anchor for the soul. It's a hope that in the wake of overwhelming circumstances, we can have confidence, a hope swagger that defies conventional wisdom. It's a hope that is tested in the Torah, solidified in the suffering, and revealed through refinement. We just need to dig deep enough to see it. After graduating from college with a degree in accounting and finance, I returned home to the same old summer job that I had for the past four years. I was working on the Kirtland Road crew, filling holes, digging ditches, and picking up roadkill. Needless to say, it was a pretty depressing start to my professional career. I had a degree in one hand and a shovel in the other. Things were not going as planned. Things were not going as I expected or anticipated. My future, it didn't look very bright. Maybe you've been in that place. Maybe you're in that place right now where what you expected isn't happening. Maybe you know someone who's in that same exact place. What do you do? How do you help them? That's what I want to talk to you about. If you have a Bible, do this. Open it up to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're continuing in our series, Hidden Hope, Behind the Hurt of Hardship. And last week, I gave you four specific words to find hope from your past. This week, I want to give you eight words to help you find hope from your future. That's the title of the message. I wish I knew back then what I do know now is this message would have been extremely helpful to me back when I was shoveling asphalt and waving a flag on the road crew. Now, the first two words, they're going to sound a bit harsh. They are. But hold on for a moment because they come straight out of the text. If you're a note taker, write this down. Grow up. Those are the two words. We're going to see them in a moment. The past is behind you. Notice verse 1. As Peter gives us five specific behaviors, these are habits that we need to say goodbye to in order to grow up. These are things we've got to just get rid of and put away. Then in verse two and three, he tells us how to grow up by comparing us to some hungry babies. Verse one, so put away all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, envy, and slander like newborn infants, Long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Let's start with what needs to go before we explain how to make it go away. By malice. That literally means wickedness. It's a desire to hurt someone with words or deeds. By deceit. This can best be understood as baiting a hook. That's the analogy. It's a desire to gain an advance or preserve a position by tricking somebody. So you're going to get ahead by trickery, by hypocrisy. This word, it finds its origin in the theater where an actor or an actress plays a part. It's a desire to be known as someone different than who you really are, who you truly are, by envy. It's a desire for some privilege or benefit that belongs to someone else as the person wants what the other person has and resentment begins to build. Shakespeare called it the green-eyed monster. By slander, this is when someone says something about someone that's just simply not true and they're trying to make themselves look good by making someone else look bad as they try to put the spotlight on someone else in hopes of hiding their own darkness. It can also be referred to as politics. But seriously, these are old habits we need to leave behind to lock the door on the past and throw away the key. If you got it, give me a hand raise. These are the habits we want to get rid of. But the question is this, how do we do it? That's where Peter goes in verse two. He describes us as infants who long for the spiritual, pure spiritual milk. That's the game changer. Now, don't be offended, especially if you're a new believer by the infant terminology. The stages of human development are often used in scripture in the New Testament to describe a person's spiritual growth. But 
more maturity. It's not always measured by the number of years in the church or the number of gray hairs on someone's head. The truth is, some have grown up in the church and they're still stuck in the terrible twos. They're still biting and kicking and hitting, while others, they're reliving those rebellious teen years, sneaking out of the house and trying to fool their parents. But what's most important is that we would each have a healthy self-awareness of our own spiritual growth track. We all need to long for the pure spiritual milk. That's what the text is saying. Let's take this one at a time. By pure, Peter's saying it's free from impurities. It's like what you buy at Whole Foods. It doesn't contain any artificial preservatives or sweeteners. And believe me, you'll pay for it a little bit extra, that's for sure. But by spiritual milk, he's referring to God's word. But we oftentimes think that's it. That's not all. There's some other natural ingredients that are mentioned in the text. They all correlate with each other. They are in combination. Take a look at chapter 1, verse 23. And we see the milk of the gospel when it says that you need to be born again, not of perishable seed, or, but imperishable seed through the living and abiding word of God. And then in verse 3, we see the milk of God's goodness when he writes, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. See, you can't separate these natural ingredients as they all work together to grow a person up in their faith so that they can reach spiritual maturity. The milk of God's word, the milk of God's gospel, and the milk of God's goodness. All of these are in the text. And as they say, milk does the body good. That's what the commercial says but especially spiritual milk. I like to think of it in this way. When the word of God is experienced through the gospel of God, you can fully enjoy the goodness of God. There's all three of those things. So don't miss the response that we need in verse two. It says that we need to long for it. The milk of God's word, the milk of the gospel, the milk of God's goodness. Some versions They translate this as crave or desire, and it's actually a command to desire, a command to crave. Very interesting. I learned a long time ago that desires are often a result of discipline. Anyone who trains themselves for anything, they know this for sure, from athletes to musicians and educators to authors. Have you ever heard of the 2190 rule? That teaches that it takes 21 days to create a new habit. And then it takes 90 days to make that habit a reality, a lifestyle change. As discipline breeds desire and desire brings delight. That's why we need to be committed to the reading and study of God's word. As the discipline of being in God's word, it develops a desire to delight in God's word. The psalmist. He paints a picture of what it looks like to be a grown-up Christian when he writes, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Next two words, to find hope in your future. Link up. That's what we need to do. We need to link up together. The future is before you. Now, notice verse four, as it describes who we need to link up to. And then in verses five through eight, it tells us what happens when we choose to link ourselves up. Verse four, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, But in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. First things first, the one to link up to is Jesus himself. Let me say that again. 
we need to link ourselves up to Jesus. Make no mistake about that. He's described as the living stone and the cornerstone to all those who turn to him and believe in him through repentance and faith. But to those who do not believe in him, that they choose not to turn to him, they choose not to link up. Peter quotes from the prophet Isaiah and he describes Jesus as a stumbling stone or a rock of offense. That's an interesting picture because what it means is that people are gonna be constantly tripping over him and stumbling over him if they choose not to embrace him by faith. So slow down for a moment. Who is Jesus to you? Is he your living stone? Or is he your stumbling stone? That is the most important question you'll ever answer in this life because your eternal destiny hinges on it as well as your present joy and happiness. Studies reveal that people have regrets at the end of their life. And so the top three regrets are this. Number one, they wish they wouldn't have spent so much time at work. Think about that after the clock strikes five and you're staying another hour. Number two regret. They wish that they could spend more time with loved ones, family members, and friends. And the third regret is that they wish they wouldn't have worried so much about things, decisions that they couldn't control. But I guarantee you this, you will never regret the decision to believe in Jesus, the decision to become a living stone. How can I be so sure of this? Well, let's look back at the text. Verse seven says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame as you will have no regrets, no regrets at all. Doubts, yes, that's normal. If you're having doubts, that's normal. Normal. We all have them, but regrets, no. Why? How come we won't have any? Well, look at how the text describes you. First, you're described collectively as living stones being built up into a spiritual house meaning you are spiritually alive and not dead. You've been given a fresh start. You've been forgiven. You've been become, you're becoming something, part of something that's way bigger than yourself. Something that's being built one changed life at a time. Something that is eternal and it will stand forever. See, the church is not a building. It's not made of bricks and mortar or steeples and stained glass. No, that, the church is a people. And we've been chosen to be changed by God. Second, you're described as holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Now, this is important because as we're described in, as priests, the priests in the Old Testament, they were devout and they were holy. And so they were separated from the people and responsible for many, making the many sacrifices to God. That's what makes this really hard for most of us to grasp. We don't think of ourselves as priests. We're not thinking of ourselves with white collars and long black robes with tassels on them, but that's who we are. As our sacrifices, as David says in Psalm 51, are a broken and a contrite heart. That's our sacrifices. And just as important, our sacrifices also include our time, our talents, and our treasure. As we are primarily responsible for building God's kingdom right here on earth. Now, theologians, they tell us that they refer to this as the doctrine of the priesthood of believers. It teaches that we as individuals, we can go directly to God ourselves. We don't need any human mediators. You don't need me to get to God and I don't need you to go to God. We all, listen closely, have direct access because of Jesus and the sacrifice he made. I mean, isn't that something to praise him for? Come on, give it a praise. That is an important thing that we can go to God ourselves. We don't need anybody else. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. That's what the scripture teaches. But it also says that we share in the responsibility of building God's kingdom using our various gifts and abilities as co-laborers in Christ. That's our responsibility to shoulder the burden and the weight of ministry together as we're building the church. I'm so thankful for the many, 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 let me say it again, many committed people here at High Point who are doing just that. Across all of our locations, they're giving their time, their talents, their treasures to, to build God's kingdom. Think of it like this. We're a collection of living stones that come from different experiences and backgrounds and giftings. And we've all been united together in this season at this time to build something that we could not build ourselves, the church. A place and a people of acceptance, a place and a people of diversity. 
the church, a place and a people of healing, a place and a people of freedom, a place and a people of second chances. That's what I love. I've been given a second chance. You've been given a second chance. That's what we're all about is the second chances we can have in Christ, our living stone. I've heard one pastor say this about the church as it brings hope to all who engage in it. God created the church to meet your five deepest needs, a purpose to live for, people to live with, principles to live by, a profession to live out, and power to live on. There is no other place on earth where you can find all five of these benefits in one place besides the church. Next two words to find hope in your future. Speak up. The time has come. Notice verses nine and 10 as we get back into the text, as we learn what to do once we grow up and link up. But you, as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may be proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter describes us in these ways. This is like a theological gold mine. First, he says, we are a chosen race. There's another reference to the doctrine of election that we already discussed in chapter one. He returns to it. That says that you've been handpicked by God out of the sea of humanity for his purposes, not because of who you are, but who Christ is, not because of what you can do for him, but what he can do through you. Second, we're a royal priesthood. And this is the only time we see this word in the New Testament as we study in Christ We are part of the royal family. You may not have recognized it. You may not have realized it. You have royalty. You are part of the royal family. Now you are spiritual princesses and princes. Not like these two on the screen showing Prince Harry and Princess Meghan. I mean, look, she's happy he's not. Why? Because they gave up their royal titles. You don't give this title up. Once you're in the kingdom, in the royal family of God, you're always in. God never lets go. This is why we come to him when we come to him. This is who we are. Third, back to the text. We're a holy nation. Again, there's so much theological truth that's sprinkled in. That's the imagery that was given to God by God to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. He was promised that his descendants would number as many as the stars in the sky. But now the people of God, it's expanded. It's no longer only identified with ethnic Israel. The apostle Paul, he makes that clear in Romans chapter 11, very significant passage for us. He teaches that the family has gotten a lot larger, the royal family, it's huge as the Gentiles were grafted in. I'm so thankful with a different heritage and an Italian heritage that for my sake, that I was grafted in. And so are many of you. The people of God are now made up of both Jews and Gentiles alike who believe in Jesus. So how are we to respond? What are our, I don't know, marching orders, so to speak? Look at verse nine. This is the important part. Don't miss it. We are to proclaim. That's what we're to do. The excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into the light, into his marvelous light. Now, the Greek word proclaim, it's only used two times in the New Testament. It's a different word that says preach. This is different than the word preach, which oftentimes you'll see. Now, preaching is what I'm doing right now. I'm on a platform or on a stage. But the emphasis here as we proclaim is on getting the word out anytime, any place within your circle of influence. So not just on a stage, not just on a platform like I'm doing, but anytime, all the time, whenever it's possible. Think of it like this. Your stage, it's your home. It's your school. It's your workplace, it's your neighborhood, it's your Facebook page, that is your stage. And any other place that you step into, both physically and digitally, that's the stage you have to proclaim who Jesus is. Now, why would you do such a thing? Because we're told, scripture tells us that we're his ambassadors and, and oftentimes people don't have a passion to do it. Well, here's three specific reasons in the text why we need to proclaim. Because once we're in the dark, but now we're in his marvelous light. 
So we want to bring other people, everyone into the light because once we were not in the royal family, but now we are in the family. We are in the family of God. So we want to bring everyone into his family because once we had not received grace or we didn't receive mercy. That's what the scripture says. But now we did receive grace. We did receive mercy. And we want to bring everyone in to receive the same thing. A few weeks ago, I was visiting Statesville Prison with Pastor Steve and Pastor Eric and a few others. It's about a 20 minute drive from our Romeoville location. We dropped off all kinds of supplies through High Point Care Center and we took a truck and you can see right here, we dropped all this stuff there. But that wasn't the primary reason we went. The primary reason we went was because we want to put a church campus in the prison, a church location right inside the gates. Yep, you heard me right. I'm talking weekly worship, teaching and discipleship for those who are incarcerated. Now, nobody's doing like exactly like this around here. It's a huge dream, a big dream that's going to require bigger prayers and big time favor. But let me give you the timeline. Last December, I was at an event and I ran into my friend Manny Mills. And he runs a post-prison fellowship ministry in the area. And he's got all kinds of connections. We started working with Manny uh, when we started the church uh, many years ago. I shared with him at this event that I had a vision, we had a vision to start a real church inside the prison. After giving me a loud hallelujah, that's what he does. He always does that. He reminded me that this was going to take some radical prayer, that this was going to have, I mean, God was going to have to open up some doors and we were going to have to pray. So we did begin to pray. A few months later, we were texting back and forth and he told me that Statesville just got a new warden who is a Christian. That was in February. And he, he's best friends with him. This new warden is great friends with Manny and he is a follower of Christ. So we've begun meeting to try to figure out how we can do this and make this dream a reality. Now, let me be honest, as I sit here and tell you this story, I'm coming to the table kind of early and getting you in. There's so many obstacles to making this happen. They have over 1,200 inmates that are serving in maximum security. And so just to get in there with all that is going to be interesting, but they have another 1,200 offenders that stay for 30 to 90 days as they get placed in other prisons in the area. They also have 1,000 employees, not to mention all the families that are represented in the area who have a son or a daughter or a brother or sister or a family member or friend in prison. We have another meeting this week. So why am I telling you all this? Well, I want you to pray for sure because we can't do this without God. I mean, we can't open these doors. This is a huge ask to be able to do this. I mean, to see this become a reality and to come into fruition, it's gonna take a lot of prayers and a lot of favor. But the reason I'm telling you this is because I wanna leverage every relationship I have for the furtherance of the gospel because I wanna proclaim the excellencies of him who called me out of darkness into the light. That's my responsibility. That's my passion. And whatever I can do to help the least of these, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 25, that's what God has called me to do. That's what God has called us to do as a church. That's why we want to shine the light of Christ. But he's also called you to do it. I'm just modeling with our church what we are being called to do. So if you really want to grow up, if you want to find hope in your future, you need to link up together. That's what we need to do. And we need to speak up. Our battle cry, it's the same as Peter and John's in Acts chapter four, verse 19. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and what we've heard. Let me share the last two words. As I said at the beginning of the message that I had eight words to share, but really it's only five different words as three of the words are just repeats. Keep up. That's the last two words. The battle has begun. Notice in verses 11 and 12, as it talks about the battle and our witness. This is our individual battle. Look at verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, that's what we are, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, and they will, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. 
let's slow down and take that one by one. To abstain. It literally means to keep your distance, to get away from some things that are harmful to you, that are not helpful. Now, it's in the present tense, and that indicates that it's not a one-time decision. It's a continuous ongoing action. It's a continual battle that you will have with the passions of the flesh. That's referring to your old life, your old patterns, your old nature, your old self. That, that's before you came to Christ. Now, the Apostle Paul, he describes his personal battle in Romans chapter 5 when he writes, For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. There we see the battle that's taking place, the constant battle. And it's more about what's on the inside than the outside, between the old and the new nature, the flesh and the spirit. That's why I love what D.L. Moody, Moody used to say. He said it repeatedly. I have more trouble with D.L. Moody than any other man. Well, that was true for him. And if I'm honest, that's true for me. That's why I like to say I have more trouble with Ron Zappia than any other man. That's true for me. That's true for you, too. That's why you need to say, come on, I have more trouble with you fill in your name than any other person. That's the truth. It's a battle. And verse 12 is a great reminder for each of us. It's not all about you. It's about your witness. It's about your reputation in the community that you would keep that battle in control. That's why Peter writes, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they will see the good deeds and glorify God in the day of visitation. By Gentiles, he's referring to those who do not know God. By speaking about you as evildoers, that, that's what they do. That's referring to the fact that people who don't get God will probably not get you. What do I mean? They, they don't understand you. You're living a different life. H has anyone ever experienced this with a family member or friend where they just didn't understand what you were about and, and why you did the things you do? Because you're following after God. You're following after his word. But remember... This is always about the long game and not the short game. That's why it says in the verse, in the day of visitation, that's referring to the day that Jesus returns. I remember when I was in college and I wasn't a Christian. I was on the basketball team and there was this graduate assistant who used to help coach. I'll never forget this guy because there was just something about him that made him stand out. He was just really different. The way he talked, the way he listened, the way he treated me, the way he encouraged me, if I'm honest, when things weren't going so great, he was there for me. It just didn't seem normal. He was different than all the other coaches. I couldn't figure him out. I, I didn't know what was happening. I could see it, but I didn't understand it at the time. He didn't share the gospel with me in word. I want to make that clear. But he did share it in deed. And it made a huge impact on me, even though I wasn't a Christian. I never forgot that graduate assistant coach. I was never able to thank him. But I'm telling you, someday I will. Your witness, it matters. How we respond, what we do, how we live our lives in front of the people that God has placed around us. You never really know in the moment how God is using you to influence and impact those around you. So, sometimes you may never know. Like this coach who came into my life for just one brief instance and season. Let me close with a few images. I, I want to try to help us to remember how to find hope for the future. So I've got some images that I want to go along with the text. First, we need to grow up. We, we've said that for sure. We see that in verse one is there's some old habits and behaviors that we need to get rid of. The text says we need to put them away. This literally means to take them off. It's what you do with a sweaty and stinky shirt and shorts after a run or a workout. If you're like me, you put them in a plastic bag at the club and, and, then, and then you throw them into the dirty laundry. That's what I got here. This is the one that contains my workout clothes from this morning at the health club. I mean, it's all right here. I put them in here. I, I just want to close it up tight because it doesn't smell really good. But I'm not going to put these clothes back on after the message and, hey, let's get those shorts and get that. I mean, of course I would not do that. 
But that's exactly what we do when we return back to those old habits and those unhealthy behaviors from the past. We need to grow up. Secondly, we need to link up. Let me ask you this question. Do you know how many bricks there are in the Empire State Building? I mean, how many of these bricks are in the Empire State Building? 10 million. Each one on its own, like the one I'm holding in my hand, it's small and insignificant. It really doesn't amount to much. But together, they can hold and build something big and strong and beautiful. I mean, powerful, that's helpful and useful to a lot of people. Listen, you and me, we're just like this brick. In our, on our own, we're just small and we're insignificant. We didn't, don't really amount to much. We don't really matter much, especially when we're isolated and alone. But together, we can build something stronger and better than the Empire State Building. I mean, we're building something that will have eternal impact and influence that will last forever. The church, we are building the church. But listen carefully, the enemy is looking for that one brick that's loose and and he wants to remove it from the rest to use it to accomplish his unhealthy agenda, his pitiful plans. Do not let that be you. First Peter says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Next, we need to speak up. That's represented by this megaphone that's on the screen. Or think about it with your smartphone. Or even, how about this fancy pen that I have? This is one of my favorite pens. Maybe you need to write a note post a message, or have a conversation with someone about the hope that you have in Jesus, because they need Jesus too. Use any and all means to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Do you want to truly seek wisdom? I mean, I want to be a smart person. I'm sure you do too. One of my favorite verses, scripture says, the one who is wise wins souls. Lastly, We need to keep up. It's too often we're lagging behind or falling behind when it comes to our own spiritual growth and development. And so I want to show you one final phrase in the text. It's in verse two, and it says, grow up into salvation. That grow up, it it literally means to grow into. Do you see the difference? Not just grow up, grow into. It's like this size 15 basketball shoe that I'm holding in my hand. I'm only a size 14, but when I was a little kid and I would go to the school, to to, to the store with my mom, what she would do is she would always buy the next size bigger. Maybe you got a mom like that, or maybe you've become a mom like that, but why do the moms do it? Because moms know that it's just a matter of time before we grow into it. That's the exact same picture of the Christian life. Listen carefully. God's just like your mom. He gave you and I, a Jesus-sized shoes to fill in, one that you need to grow into. Or maybe the better analogy is he gave us some sandals, but as we're never supposed to stop growing and changing on this side of eternity, no matter how old you are, no matter how long you've been walking with him, he wants you to grow one size bigger, one size stronger, one size wiser, because we're all trying to be like Christ. He is our example. He is our role model. So as we close, which one of these do you need to focus on to find hope? Take a moment and ask God for his guidance. Ask God for his help as he desires to give you hope for not only today, but hope for tomorrow and hope for your future. I like to say it like this. Jesus is the only hope for the world And he's hoping that we, the church, will be his primary means of expressing it, extending it, and exhibiting it to all those around us.